uh, I'm going to get started, you all, um, and soon I'll be introducing um, our person who is going to uh, start us off. And I just want to thank you all for joining this webinar. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Dave Ragland, and I'm the senior Bayard Rustin Fellow at Fellowship of Breakfast. Like and I wanted to let you know. So we're going to mute um, anyone who's not talking. Thank you. Um, so we began talking about uh, reparations um, in different places. Uh, in Ferguson, um, in the, the Truth Telling Project, um, we were thinking about all of the people who told their stories about the violence they experienced. And one thing we remembered or, or started to realize was that as people told their stories, there were folks crying at hearing the stories. And for those who had experienced violence, and at times that was re-traumatizing. So we started thinking about reparations as the midpoint between truth and reparation and reconciliation. That for communities that experience so much material harm, that we would need to, or there would need to be some kind of repair. Along those lines, at Fellowship of Reconciliation, we reflected back to James Farmer, Foreman, almost 50 years ago, who went to a number of spiritual communities and talked about the need for economic justice. He asked for reparations on behalf of African Americans, Black folks. At that time, Fellowship of Reconciliation was one of the organizations that had been approached, um, especially since Fellowship of Reconciliation is connected to a number of spiritual communities. Instead, organizations who are interested in social justice like ours turn to fight and stand against the war in Vietnam. Often we view reparations as an either or. Either I do it for this group, or we do it for that group, or we do it for this group. But often, Black folks were left out of that equation. So as we began thinking about what reparations looks look like, we began talking to a number of activists and folks um, around the country and the world who have been thinking about reparations. And what we came to understand uh, was that many people have already started thinking about reparations and taking it into their own hands, but view it as more than just money. Even though in this country, money or cash, right? Wu-Tang Clan says cash rules everything around me. Money in this culture represents so many things, so much value. Money has replaced value. And that's why reparations isn't just about money, it's about healing. It's about who do we value? It's about how do we heal sin, America's original sin, which is black folks, the theft of labor, the theft of bodies, the usage of bodies. But we also understand that, that, that those original violence, however deplorable, continues today, initially through the Jim Crow legacy, and now through 
what Michelle Alexander termed New Jim Crow, but we see it every day in our streets where black and brown folks are killed by police. But we also see it in ways that are rather insidious. We see it in reports like the Center for Investigative Journalism that describe how black folks are less likely to get a mortgage, even if they have better credit and more cash on hand than white folks. And that this is actually uh, allowed or happens under the Fair Housing Act. And the Fair Housing Act that was supposed to provide housing for people who lived in urban communities. But we see that that's actually led and made way for the last two decades of generation, of uh, gentrification. ProPublica reported that black communities are more likely to be targeted by debt collect collection. So how does moral harm enter in today's conversation, even if you were not, or, or your, dis, your ancestors were, did not take part in slavery. And we see it as essentially a direct um, relationship, the injustice that Blacks experience and the privileges that many white folks in this country enjoy. And so today's panel, uh, we're so excited because we have a number of amazing guests. Um, but before I introduce them, um, I want to introduce um, our, is Amber on the call? I will, Amber has, is, uh, Amber McZeal is a PhD candidate at Pacifica Graduate Institute. She's a healer. Um, she is a decolonial scholar and activist, and she is offering um, a prayer to begin um, our conversation here. And I see Amber and All right, if we can unmute Amber. Can you hear me okay? Yes, now we can. Go, go ahead, Amber, uh, you just went mute again. Can you hear me okay now? Now we Perfect. can. <laughs> Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you for the invitation to um, share. And pardon me, I'm in a, a new space. It's snowing here. My, uh, my internet was a little choppy for a second there. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge what you said about money has replaced value. Um, because that's exactly the spirit in which I, I share this. Um, in the spirit of what does a decolonial attitude really mean and what does it feel like? Um, how do we transform value? How do we form values in general? Um, so this is just a, a, a poetic prayer on cultivating a decolonial attitude. So if you can hear the sound of my voice, let your shoulders fall from your ears. Allow your jaw to relax. Let your tongue fall from the roof of your mouth. Breathe into the space you take up. Breathe into the skin you're in. Breathe into the gratitude for having life. The project of decoloniality is essentially about nurturance and care the spiritual and moral wounding caused by racialization 
insist that we practice care and nurturance in a more radical way. I'm using the term radical here in its traditional sense. I want to emphasize the root. The etymology of radical relates to root, to foundation, to soil. The soil as we understand it within this decolonial framework it is rooted in hierarchies and racialization and inequality. And that's what we're seeking to transform by cultivating a decolonial attitude. I want to share with you a piece that I wrote about this. Um, it says, the anagram for race is care. A race succeeds at dividing care and congeal hearts with mine. The anagram for race is care. Where race succeeds at dividing, care congeals hearts with minds selves with others beyond the dream of race we are chanced with crafting care for me the decolonial attitude repositions my approach to slavery to repair to harm and to healing and i want to offer that new perspective to you i want to offer the soul-centered perspective that has become a part of my practice if I can tap into another dimension of coloniality, I bear witness to a radical love tradition of decolonial expression that has and still exists in eloquent simultaneity. Parallel to the heartbreak and soul wounding of coloniality, it deeds the unceasing pulse of radical love traditions where the periphery has always lived existed, created, imagined in a type of pluriverse. So a decolonial approach can recenter spirituality in our pursuit of liberation and more humane social relationships. I pray that we find the methods and the collective agreement to imbue our institutions and social structures with the wisdom and radical love of the periphery, that the power of this love transforms the social imaginary, refining our shared values and transforming our concepts of social harmony. I pray we release racialization as a naturalized phenomenon, transforming that logic at cellular depth. So if you can hear my voice, allow your soul to embrace the radical love tradition as foundational to decolonial praxis and practice allowing your shoulders to fall from your ears. Unclench your jaw and release your tongue from the roof of your mouth. May we practice nurturance and care with ourselves and each other as we unlearn the logic of dehumanization recentering in a radical love tradition. And I just want to leave you with a very short meditation from Thich Nhat Hanh on this idea of love praxis. It's from his book, How to Love. And this passage is called Heart Like a River. If you pour a handful of salt into a cup of water, the water becomes undrinkable. But if you pour the salt into a river, people can continue to draw the water to cook, wash, and drink. The river is immense and it has the capacity to receive, embrace, and transform. When our hearts are small, our understanding and compassion are limited and we suffer. We can't accept or tolerate others and their shortcomings and we demand that they change. But when our hearts expand, these same things don't make us suffer anymore. We might have a lot of understanding and compassion, 
and can embrace others. We accept others as they are, and then they have a chance to transform. So the big question is, how do we help our hearts grow? Thank you. And um, now I want to introduce Chrissy Jackson, who is the co-director of the Truth Telling Project uh, and co-founder of the Truth Telling Project. And uh, she is going to begin uh, introducing our guest. Thank you for that, David. Thank you so much, Amber. That was really great. Thank you for that welcome. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for participating in our discussion today. Thank you for your interest in um, reparations beyond compensation, but also as a form of um, moral and spiritual atonement for, um, for our country and for us as an extension. Um, we have really awesome guests today. I'm super excited to hear from you all. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, list our guests and then we're gonna go ahead and start with the first question. So um, here with us today, we have Dante Washington. He is a constitutional and criminal law attorney. He graduated from Yale Divinity School and is a consultant at sacrednavigation.org. Um, we also have with us Rabbi Lynn. Um, Rabbi Lynn is director of Jewish Peace Fellowship. Um, we have Reverend Renita Green, who is an ordained AME church minister, pastor of St. James AME in Cape Girardeau, AKA the People's Church and a a very active community organizer. Um, and then we have Brother Jamoke Ipitayo from Encobra. He, he started the Ashe Committee for Spirituality and Faith to Advance Reparations and um, has been doing work to advance reparations for a very long time. Um, and then 8 p.m. We will be joined by Reverend Angel Williams. She is an ordained Zen priest, an American writer, and author of Being Black, Zen, and the Art of Living with Fearlessness and Grace, and also the author of Radical Dharma. So again, thank you all for joining us today. And um, we're gonna go ahead and start with our first question. And if you guys can take five to seven minutes to answer. Also, if you'd like to add a little bit more about yourself, please do. Um, so our first question is, what are some of the connections that can be made between spirituality and reparations? And Brother Jamoke, would you like to start us off? All right. Uh, well, again, let's, uh, I want to uh, thank Amber for um, centering us and giving us a powerful introduction. And thank you, know, thank um, Fellowship of Reconciliation for allowing me to be a part of this panel and this conversation. So I think a good place to begin always when you're talking about different things is, is with definitions or defining. And so for me, um, spirituality basically means uh, how one connects with or lives in harmony with the creator, with the earth and its inhabitants, uh, which would, not, would be humans, but also animals, insects, the trees, the plants, the water. And and so, yeah, it's how, how, how do we find ourselves living in harmony with those things uh, is how we express our, our spirituality. Um, oftentimes, I think of religion as giving us tools of discipline 
to uh, moving us to our own spirituality. And then some people feel like when you may evolve to a certain level and you can still keep those religious tools, but that you don't necessarily need those tools uh, or you can use those tools as you need to, to um, strengthen your connection um, with spirit. So spirituality and then reparations. So reparations is about healing and repair. Uh, how is the process of how a group of people that have been harmed um, is restored. Uh, as of course, as Dave said in the beginning, money is, is one component of that, but the actual restoration and the healing is done through many different ways and um, whether that's through legislation, whether that's through uh, monuments, whether that's through changing the, the narrative, uh, the story about that, those people that have been harmed, um, those people having their own form of self-determination and self-governance, uh, many different forms that that can take place. So for me, linking the two together means so we, we, we acknowledge that a harm has happened, and then how do we bring back the harmony, which is as I define in terms of spirituality, how do we bring back that harmony? And so reparations becomes that uh, tool um, to help us to bring back that harmony with ourselves, uh, with, with the community, with, our, with the nation we find ourselves in, with the world that we live in. So. Um, I'll stop there and um, let some other people um, contribute to the answer. Thank you for that. I like that harmony, repair and harmony. Dante yeah. Washington, would you like to go next? Um, yes, I think, um, I think I very much agree with that, um, definition. I like the definition of spirituality there. I also, um, like the definition of reparations as about healing and repair. Um, I also, one of the things that, that I contemplate when I think about reparations is is also balancing it. I guess seeing the the yin and yang, the reparations is is a relational thing between the people who had the harm and have been harmed, right? But there's also another side because there's for everything there's also the not sort of the shadow, but like the negative kind of like if I if my hand is here, there's the space around my hand, so that's that's also my hand in a way. And so when I think about reparations, the, the, the negative space, the yin space around that is actually the internal process of the person, um, I'm gonna focus on the person who's been harmed of their own capacity to heal themselves. Um, I think was being talked about already, um, but, I, but I also see the, the significance of being able to have the inner dignity yourself when you've been uh, mistreated, you've been a, um, a victim of, it, of injustice, so that reparations actually make sense from the perspective of those who are, had done the in injustice. There's a certain almost a social dynamic that occurs um, that when someone, when someone is, is, is sort of laid out in a um, helpless or like a disempowered position, it actually sort of invites a kind of contempt, which makes it ironically harder for, um, for you to get the repair and healing coming from those who are causing the injustice, right? So there's something about when the victim stands up or in, whether that's literally or a certain kind of resilience is revealed um, or demonstrated that actually um, weakens and undermines that contempt and creates a ground 
that's easier for that connection. So when I think about the spirituality of reparations, I'm also thinking about the spirituality of restoring inner dignity of the person who has suffered um, the injustice prior to the engagement uh, with the, the people or institutions or structures that had caused the problems, um, which actually will increase the chance that some kind of reparative, that, the, that those who have been oppressive become partners in the healing. And so that's a thought that I'm having around this. Uh, I hand it back to you. Thank you, Dante. Renita. Um, so in, in the work that I do mostly um, in help try, attempting to help white people move um, from toxic whiteness to being delivered from toxic whiteness. Um, when I think about spirituality and reparations and the, that connection for white people, it starts with confession. And that's how we understand, um, you know, we, we can't be healed. We can't move forward if we haven't repented and we can't repent unless we've confessed. Um, so, um, so what, what, so what I see is the necessity for, um, for white people to understand how historic, um, white stuff has infected the systems and structures that we um, continue to perpetuate and continue to hold people in bondage today. Um, and if, um, if, and, and I'm speaking kind of more from a Christian perspective and and the community and and that I serve. Um, I don't know that we can authentically call ourselves Christians and continue to perpetuate these cycles of oppression and um, And white people have been so ingrained in um, in racism and and the effects of racism that what they they see it as normal. And so when there's talk about reparations, the the um, comments tend to be like, "Well, we didn't do anything; it's not our fault." You can't pay back, um, which totally lets us off the hook for bringing healing to our collective community. Um, when part of the spiritual work is seeing that we're one community, that we're not a black community and a white community, that as humankind, we're one community. And when white people refuse to, acknowledge the impact of, of um, our history, um, we miss the opportunity to, to, to be merged in authentic community. So, so the spiritual, the spiritual um, discipline, the spiritual act is confession and to confess the sins, to confess the sins that of our ancestors and to confess the sins of our ignorance, to confess our sins of complacency, to complace, confess our sins of complicitness. And it is in that confession that we can move toward authentic repentance, which is a decision to no longer be complicit with the systems of racism and um, 
and and to um, reject um, the privilege of of whiteness, and then um, and then we can move to um, reparations or restorations. Um, and I think that that if we as the community got could get to confession and repentance, that the, that very next logical step is how do we repair? And um, and that that the the heart work, it, the spiritual, it, it's a work of the heart. It can't just be a work of the head. And when once it becomes a work of the heart, then it's it will come natural, and um, it it will be the natural evolution of what's next. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for that. Rabbi Lynn. Shalom Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, everyone. Um, uh, this, may be my, <laughs> this may be my only comment, but uh, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I am not uh, involved with the Jewish Peace Fellowship, although I just once was, just to be clear um, about that. I'm Today, I've, I'm really speaking as chair of the Board of Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, um, where I do a lot of my organizing these days, and as well as Jewish Peace Fellowship, where I sit on the Rabbinic Council, and Shomer Shalom, which is a practice that perhaps relates to what we're doing. So I think a great word for um, spirituality in our tradition is Shalom. Um, because it does mean wholeness and living in harmony with uh, the life around you, all, all living being. And that is the, that is a practice um, and both a practice and an aspiration. Um, we have a whole system of practices, which we call mitzvot which obligate us to engage in actions that both prevent harm and also be accountable for the harm that we've caused. And then to restore equity through acts, through acts of restorative justice or reparations, which in Hebrew are called tikkun. And uh, this, this idea is related to person's ability to access dignity which uh, and, and to access sustainable resources. We, um, we are a very communal people and we have a highly developed system of reparations and at the same time for me personally without looking at critical race theory for myself and my community my community, this is sort of the third space in contemporary America that really has profoundly impacted the way all of us think about our own process of what we might call chuva or reparations. And I'm just going to share a little bit about that. Uh, not so much critical race theory, because I think I'm not the person to really speak about that as an expert. But in Jewish tradition, there's the idea that public fasting as a form of acknowledgement of harm caused public fasting, not, not so much the personal or private, but we usually beat our chest together. That is followed while we're fasting as a way of spiritually putting ourselves in some kind of empathy with the harm that we've done to breathe it in and understand it and really give witness to it. Um, there's a vidui or an enumeration of the harm that we've caused in public and collective forum. And this is not about individual salvation for us, although collective good does help all of us, but chuva demands collective accountability and public restor restoration. And then there's this idea that we have to pursue justice, make it proactive and pursue reparations. And pursuit is a proactive endeavor that demands risk taking, change of behavior, undergoing an internal process of awakening and healing 
to undergo the change that we need to be part of, to restore well-being. And of course, when faced with the same set of institutionally embedded forms of harm, we must be proactive in not repeating the harm, which means changing our way of doing business. And in, in my own community, one thing this means is that acknowledging, first of all, that 10% of Jewish people living in North America on Turtle Island are Jews of color. Jews who are Ashkenazi have a great deal to do to acknowledge the ways Jews of color are harmed within our own communities from the micro to the macro levels of aggression. Um, African American Jews are constantly, and, and non white Jews are constantly challenged by Ashkenazi Jews and others whether or not they're really Jewish. Um, white Ashkenazi institutions receive financial resources for all kinds of social justice projects, but Jews of color do not. Um, in the aftermath of Pittsburgh, for instance, and may their memories be a blessing, many Jewish communities started thinking about hiring more security and police. However, Ashkenazi Jews need to acknowledge how this impacts people of color within our own community and others. Jamel Robinson's tragic death is a warning about the harm embedded in militarization of police. And on a larger scale, in terms of reparations for as I think about it as a Jewish person, the militarization of U.S. policing has deep ties to Israeli military policies of surveillance, drones, use of tear gas, warehousing, tanks in the street, narratives that dehumanize Palestinians. And, and for me as a Jewish person thinking about reparations here on Turtle Island, I cannot ignore the ways in which we are accountable and complicit in, provide, in, in supporting the, the institutions that harm. So as a white Jewish person, as an Ashkenazi Jewish person, we can't silo or just spiritualize these intersectional connections, um, even as we all remain vigilant against anti-Semitism. So reparations for me is the perfect, uh, instrument for Chuva in that acknowledges that without the analysis and leadership of communities subject to racism, any remedy that we choose in the white community or think about to address racial discrimination will not be successful. We have to acknowledge that racism is a permanent feature of American society, not an aberration. We're not returning to some pure past. or uh, we, are, we are trying to work on something that has not yet been achieved. Um, so only reparations, remedies that begin with acknowledging the full impact of one ongoing harm can really work. And I feel like reparate, I feel so honored to be part of a community that's thinking about reparations and listening carefully for, for the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade and the descendants of first peoples who were subject to to genocide of, of colonial settler conquest. I know so much has been lost and any authentic kind of spirituality must create spaces for mourning, spaces for anger, spaces for storytelling in ways that are healing and not re-traumatizing of people who are profoundly impacted and spaces for active pursuit of reparations in ways that restore, um, restore our hearts and our capacity to live together, to honor our distinctions and to envision our collective humanity and to affirm all the expressions of our humanity, the trans, community, the queer community, uh, the Islamic community, Jewish community, the black and brown communities, indigenous communities, and to center those voices, especially voices who are still being so profoundly harmed in the pursuit of reparations. And I pray that, um, that together, uh, Si se puede, we will find a way. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you for that, Rabbi Lynn. And I believe Reverend Angel is on. Reverend Angel, would you like to go ahead and um, answer our first question is, what are the connections between spirituality and reparations? Okay, I think that it's just a it's just a saved place. So sorry about that, you guys. Um, David, would you like to go ahead and ask the next question? All right, I will go ahead and do that. So as you talk about, um, you know pursuing reparations i think another uh, a next appropriate question would be so what responsibility do spiritual institutions have to help redistribute resources into local communities as a form of reparations and Dante Washington, would you like to go ahead and start us off with that answer? There, okay. Um, yeah, I think I was I was curious about that because I think it, there's a um, there's a question as to whether just the act of engaging in a local community, which a spiritual institution should do just sort of in general. It's it sort of, it, it wouldn't make sense for um, a community, a spiritual community that was embedded in a community to then completely ignore it. That doesn't, though it happens, not like it doesn't happen, but it's, it's just sort of strange, uh, just by the nature of what a spiritual community that's like a neighborhood church or synagogue, um, Whatever, that, that just, that's weird. The other thing though, that's also odd about the question, I think where I was sort of um, spinning in a, in a thought about it was, was that reparations in general, I think, um, and I'm being a lawyer, I'm thinking about it more in terms of the reply to something that has been harm, harmful that maybe the community created. So in this case, it assumes that the spiritual community in that place had created an injustice and then therefore has a obligation to, to do something, right? So is there a type of reparation where the person who's doing the reparation, I think this is the question that's begging to me, the person or institution doing the reparation is doing it without having been the person or system that substantially created the problem, right? Now, of course that could happen, right? But it's it's an interesting definition of reparations because now on the, on the side of the person doing the acts of repair, we've detached them from being responsible for having caused the issue. And I think this is there. There's a potential trap here because when when a, when people try to do work to alleviate a type of suffering, like in a sense, like re, release the the, the pressure off of a situation, but without the parties that were involved ever really engaging, there's, there's, a, um, there's a mismatch. So I think that that's, that's part of what I'm, I'm stumbling over. And, and so, yeah, of course, a, a community should, a spiritual community should engage, um, engage the community they're in and do reparative work. I don't know if I want to say reparations, um, but if it was responsible for something, then for sure, right? And here's the other thing is a lot of times when you're thinking about, especially in the context of where institutions are gathered compared to where they've caused negative externalities or outright like injustice, a lot of times they're not geographically located in the place where they really, they should do a reparation in the most like strictest of senses, right? Where you can have a, a, a community of people, say maybe in a suburban context, 
and the the people who are benefiting from some sort of injustice actually live and congregate there but then the reparation they really should be doing is not necessarily in literally their geographical area but they need to they need to adopt or in, engage in a focused effort somewhere that's not necessarily local but actually is related to what they're creating so in, in that sense it this changes this conversation because then the, the definition of community has to be broadened or or matched i think that's really what i'm saying it's like you got them because that's the sneaky part right you got all kinds of people doing charity all over the place right that has nothing to do with what they're responsible for right so you actually feel really great like doing this charity work in our local area you know raising money and giving food to people and whatever and an, or or advocating or whatever for people in an area that you didn't necessarily or want did not do something unjust to you're just being helpful when there actually is a group of people you've maybe done something unjust to and there's no connection right so it's actually a sneaky little trap you know who who is our community where are what is reparations and and reparative work detaching reparative work from responsibility it just feels um feel sneaky and shady and it just and and it, but it's a trap that we fall into and can feel really great about and by we i i don't necessarily mean myself but i just mean the kind of person or system the we the systems of people and um institutions that are doing this i do want to mention one thing for the last question if i may i wanted to read something because i feel like it actually it may help in this conversation because part of reparations i mean if you go back into the sort of like the deeper history of like i would say maybe like the judeo-christian um intuition but also sort of just the intuition that's just um social like i'm talking about going back to going back to that place where where when people were were thinking about reparation in terms of trying to deflect a certain kind of primal vision of divine judgment. And so I want to I want to read this um actually from from President Lincoln because I from his second inaugural address because I feel like the framing his framing of this is the civil war has been going on for 4 years. It's almost over. Um the way he frames this and it's something i feel people don't remember that he said or it's not in common parlance people don't realize that the president of the united states president of the united states said these words and i think in putting putting the harm and the issues of injustice in the context of divine approval or disapproval and that the ideas of say like you know in a traditional um Christian context for example of of repentance where you're repenting in part I mean the the lowest form of repentance is the attempt to avoid divine judgment like a higher form would be that you actually realize something is wrong and and you want to make things better right but some people are motivated by um lower forms of of um, self preservation you could say um but I want to read this and and just to put this put our conversation in some kind of historical context So he's talking about the civil war and he's talking about its causes. He's already said that everyone knows that that the that slavery is the reason why the war has happened. And then he says this, the almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. He's quoting a piece of scripture. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those great offenses which in the province of God must needs come but which having continued through his appointed time he now wills to remove and that he gives to both north and south this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes 
which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth plied by the blind man's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be repaid by another drawn with the sword. As it was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And I think that this, this statement is that near the end of his speech is shocking because it, saying something like this now would be, um, you know, it, it's abs it would it would it would be somehow treasonous or um, it's far outside the mainstream of like American thought, um, political thought in particular, and it would be seen as an, an extreme or radical statement that the Civil War was a divine judgment. But his frame of mind is that basically he's saying if it turns out that all of this stuff continues to happen. The truth is we deserve it. And this is a very interesting thing, we being North and South, that we deserve it. Now this is the, again, the lowest level of, of processing around an issue of justice is, is having it be an issue of punishment, right? When you're talking about reparations, you're talking about healing, repairing situations, allowing relationships to come back together, or maybe even just be together in harmony for the first time. That may be the possibility. But the fact that there actually is a story here within our context as a nation, not from, from my story, but from a white person who was running the government at the moment this whole thing went down, right? That his reflection of what the spiritual meaning of what he was experiencing, that everyone was experiencing, was divine judgment in some way. Um, this, is, um, this is a foundation philosophically for the idea of reparations, because reparations is actually, like I said, it's about healing and um, building harmonious relationships, not about punishment, right? Um, so, but knowing that that's there, um, I think it's actually significant. So I just wanted to, maybe that I wanted to extend my remarks about thinking about spirit, the connection between spirituality and reparations. Um, yeah. So the reference, the reference is that that's the end of um, President Lincoln's second inaugural address. I think it's uh, March 4th, I think, March 4th, 1865. Um, and you can read the first one. His first inaugural address is just shocking difference. You know, it's a shocking difference. He came a long way, came a long way. Um, so anyway, thank you. Mm. So uh, thank you, thank you, Dante. We were gonna ask um, Rabbi Gottlieb to, Rabbi Lynn to uh, share some thoughts about this question before she takes off. Um, I think, uh, yep, she had to go, but thank you so much, uh, Rabbi yeah. Lynn. Yeah, I just, I, okay. I just say that, um, I, I think this, it's, it's impossible for a single institution really uh, to do much, but, uh, and this is not charity work. This can't be thought of charity work. It's just not charity work, it's justice work. And, and um, for, me, for me and a lot of my community, we, we need to take intersectional approaches or we're not gonna be very successful. And again, for me, in, in, tra in what I can do in my community is, is help them understand critical race theory and the framework for acting through that theory, even as we uh, may employ our spiritual resources, um, all of our holidays and a whole variety of things that we do, our ceremony our, our, to you know, strengthen our culture, but without that intersectional approach and justice approach, we won't be successful. So I, I'm so grateful to be um, part of this movement for reparations. And um, I, I do hope that real justice comes quickly and in our day. 
um, good luck everyone. And hopefully I'll see you again on the road to justice. Thank you, Rabbi Lynn. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi Lynn. Um, and so next we wanna go to Reverend Renita uh, to respond to that question. And I'll just um, uh, repeat it again. And it's specifically about what are the responsibility of spiritual institutions uh, for redistributing uh, resources. And as, um, as um, Dante pointed out, um, particularly um, when communities are complicit um, in the system of violence and benefiting from that complicity. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, so um, one thing Dante said was, um, um, can, can religious communities, are they supposed to, or are they challenged to reply to something harmful uh, or created an injustice um, or some that about an injustice that they didn't necessarily create? And, and I think um, that, that completely religious communities have created did this injustice and have um, historically used um, the ancient text um, to perpetuate violence against people. Um, and then, and um, the, the scripture says in Micah that we are to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. And the Protestant Christian church, I can speak from that perspective, seems to do charity and love accolades and walk very arrogantly um, without any real acknowledgement of God. If we are going to um, be who we say we are or be who we profess we want to be, um, we have to do more than have food pantries in our churches. As food pantries in our churches is not um, an act of reparations. It's not and not repairing our community. It's not atoning for our sin. Um, food pantries in our churches might at best be an act of mercy, um, but um, it is removing the cause. The need for a food pantry is where the Christian community, the faith community needs to um, engage in that work. So removing those causes um, for needing a food pantry. And I'm just using this as one example. And you look at the poverty in our communities and the disproportionate distribution of felony convictions that um, prevent um, primi primarily African-American men from attaining meaningful, gainful career track employment. Um, the rate at which our men are incarcerated and sitting in jail and the cash bail system that is keeping them causing them to lose their homes, their families, their jobs. Um, the faith community has to engage these issues. We, ha we have to engage our legislators. We have to speak about this from the pulpit. Um, we have to teach and, and, um, and compel our, the people in, in our communities to... Um, to engage this very holy and sacred work and to see it as sacred work. Um, when, when the faith community allows itself to feel good about who it is, um, just because we're handing out rations, I mean, this is, it, it is us still being in that same position. We tell people what they're gonna eat, how much they're gonna eat, how much they deserve to eat, whether it's handing out food stamps or it's handing out care packages, it's the same thing. Um, and so we, we can't even say that we have come a long ways when we're doing the exact same thing that our ancestors did, we're just doing it in a prettier package. Um, so, so when we talk about what the responsibility is of the faith community or is the faith community responsible for the redistribution of, um, of assets, of wealth, um, yes, the faith community is completely responsible. Um, and I would say that the, the, the main responsibility of the faith community is to move out of charity and into 
justice work um, and, um, and to challenge ourselves to not feel good about feeling good, um, but to um, engage the difficulties of the processes and the people who are creating the obstacles that continue to perpetuate these cycles. I guess that's all, that's what I have to say. Back to you, Christy. Thank you for that. And Reverend Angel, are you on the call? That I saw pop up. Hey, Brother Jamoke, would you like to go ahead and answer the question next? What are the um, responsibilities of spiritual institutions into redistributing resources into their community, into communities in general? Sure. Um, I can see why um, Dante struggled with that question. Um, I uh, understand that. And, you know, I, I think uh, Reverend Anita really hit on it was really important. For me, uh, reparations has to be systematic um, and has to address systems. That's, that's what perpetuates what we find in our lives, not the individual uh, situations. I mean, it's a, you know, we can lift up individual situations from time to time. But more important is the systems that are in place. And so the, the work has to go into the area of transforming those systems, uh, changing those systems, ending those systems. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, that's exactly on point. Um, you know, not doing um, charity work, but doing um, systems change work and speaking about system change work. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I have said in this, this work, and Dave and I have discussed this, is, you know, that I think that part of the, the challenge to the faith community could be to put, to support the reparations movement specifically, as a, not so much like putting money into different, you know, organizations that are doing work in the community, which is more charity work, but actually to support the movement for reparations. Um, so as we design a more systematic um, uh, approach, uh, plan to, to address um, comprehensively, systematically reparations. Mm. Thank you, Brother Jamoke. Um, I think we want to we uh, want to check and see if uh, Reverend Angel had a chance to come on yet. And um, I'm just going to repeat two of the questions. And um, if and the two questions that uh, we've already asked and that folks are responding to is the connections between spirituality and reparations. And what are the responsibilities of spiritual institutions and communities? Uh, particularly um, in terms of uh, complicity and um, the the legacy of slavery, which is police violence and, and the system that we, we live in today. Um, so um, do we have, okay. Um, so if we don't have Reverend Angel yet, then we will, um, here are a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, a number of people have been asking questions. Dave, yeah, would you like to go ahead and uh, ask the first question? Sure, so some of the questions uh, that came in are, um, what are the healing and spiritual components of reparations? Uh, what kind of spiritual and healing rituals can advance the movement for reparations? Uh, and so um, why don't we hear from... Uh, uh, Dr. You. Okay, go ahead. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Brother Jamal. Okay. So, um, yeah, 
one of the things as a, a spiritual activist and, and on my journey, I've come to make a distinction between ceremonies and rituals. So ceremonies are things that are done kind of over and over again to um, remember something or to uh, uh, support a particular value or belief or, you know, um, to um, remember a particular person or what have you. And um, so that's ceremonies. And ceremonies have their place. Ceremonies are important because they help people to um, collectively um, focus in on whatever the intent is, right? Now, rituals, on another hand, are something that's, in my opinion, done on a higher level, on a different level. Rituals are something where you have people who are trained um, and people who have a certain level of experience in spirit and, is, and are priests or priestesses or have a certain level of um, experience, like I said. And what you do is you say, this is our intent. Our intent is X, whatever the intent is. And then you basically could create a container. You create a spiritual container or a space for that to happen. You may have drumming, you may have dancing, you may have um, certain sacred um, uh, herbs and um, incenses may be burned to create that space, a certain mask, a certain costumes may be worn. But what happens is that in ritual, the, there's an intent, but the, the, the intent is that spirit will come in to the ritual and take over the ritual, so to speak. And, it, and so, you, so again, so ritual is quite different than ceremony. So ceremony might have a start time and an end time. Ritual doesn't have a start time or end time because we, you don't know what, what will happen when, when spirit um, comes into the um, ritual. And, um, and, and, you know, I've, I've been a part of some very powerful rituals, some that, you know, lasted for days. And um, so, you know, so, so, when we, so I wanted to make that, that distinction um, between ritual and ceremony. So even when we talk about ritual for reparations, it would be something that would be kind of done uh, those who know, know. And it would be done in a way that, you know, may not be, you know, uh, probably, you know, advertised and uh, videotaped and flyers for and that kind of a thing. However, I do think that we can develop some ceremony that can help to uh, advance the movement for reparations. And those, you know, those things could be, you know, uh, promoted and, uh, videotaped if we choose and all of that. Um, I'm actually in the process of working with a sister uh, who is a, a Haitian priestess um, who, who lives in New York and we've been having some conversations around developing a ceremony for uh, reparations um, and so we're still in the development stage on that and actually we'll probably have a ceremony component and a ritual component but we'll probably mostly just talk about the ceremonial component mostly publicly. And so, um, you know, actually, uh, right now, this month, I, I will be meeting with her. She, she's also in communication with the uh, high priest from Benin, um, not, uh, Benin, West Africa. And, and we will be um, working on, on creating such a ceremony with others as well, because we want it to be an uh, uh, interfaith type ceremony. We want it to be uh, set up in such a way with different faith traditions will feel comfortable in participating in it um, or may have different, you know, we'll have different um, versions of it, I guess, or different aspects of it that would uh, lend itself to different faith traditions. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Jamoke. Um, Dante, do you want to respond to uh, the question that came out um, around healing and uh, spiritual components of reparations? as well as um, spiritual and uh, healing rituals that could advance, uh, particularly in, in Black communities, uh, advance the movement for reparations. Now, I was thinking about this. Um, I think that the, um, when you're thinking about ritual in this context, I wanted to go back to what I had said earlier when I was thinking about reparations itself and thinking about the yin space of reparations, which is the work, the inner work that happens for those, those who actually had been harmed, those who are the, who are the victims or the, um, the objects of the injustice. 
and creating that yeah, creating that space of the the space in which the spirit um lands or arises uh, depending on which way you think um creating that inner connection and i think that two things that come to mind for me one is actually a communal action among those who've experienced injustice i'm thinking about for example some of the work that happened um, in the Montgomery bus boycott, where part and parcel of that boycott was the fact that people in the community did in fact, who had cars, so those who did have them, did share them or found ways to help the people who didn't, because all these people are taking the bus for a reason. I mean, they're not doing it because they just want to, right? And so we're gonna boycott the bus in order to do that, it turns out there is there were some sort of resources that were available um, to help people get around. And on one hand, that looks like that's practical, but I actually can see that as a spiritual practice. It's a spiritual practice that shows that the community finally was standing together across different levels of, of class and that the level of resistance to the evil they're experiencing, it does bring out the sense of dignity, right? that this community is not gonna ride this bus anymore. And not only that, they have an ability to still get around. Like, the, so there's this, there's this, um, there's a demonstration to, um, to the oppressor of a resilience. And I think there's something there for the community itself of actually people starting to see each other in a particular way and, and moving beyond just it being a practical matter for the purpose of the protest, but actually it's a sense of recognition that is about harmonizing and connecting internally. And if, I, if you think about it in terms of maybe like um, a single person in a having a psychological resiliency and spiritual resiliency to maybe an individual situation of abuse, maybe, um, maybe someone who's being bullied or something like this, uh, like a teenager at school, right? There's the ability to be able to tap into your inner dignity within and, and, and really gain an internal resource by taking care of yourself, even though you feel like you're in an environment or you are in an environment where people are not taking care of you or they're actively harming you. There's something about doing that that is actually a spiritual practice. Right. So if I take that individual idea and expand it to the community where the community acts like an organism, a single organism together and practices self care in that way. There's there's a way of acknowledging what the divine actually does, that love the divine actually has for that communal organism by practicing it among themselves. Right. So that's one that um, that occurs to me. And you can ritualize that. You can find a way to, while you're sharing the resource, you're clear that it's not really about the resource. It's, it's also about the mutual acknowledgement of that system, of that, that group of people to each other, of their common humanity and the dignity of that humanity, regardless of how they're being treated from outside, which, um, which allows a, a, a space for the spirit to arise. And um, the other one is narrative. I think the significance, I'm thinking about, um, especially in the Jewish tradition of like Passover and Purim, these different stories where they, where these miracles happen or Hanukkah or whatever, where basically they, 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 there's a desire to keep telling the story of how the group of people had agency despite the fact that, um, an agency that came from internal resources. And when I say internal resources, I'm including God in that, even though I, I personally understand God is beyond our subjectivity. But there's, there is, when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about the spirit, I'm talking about gaining access to that, that ultimate reality through the, the deepest, deepest part of our subjectivity, right? So the, when we're in these narrative patterns, and where we're proclaiming them to each other about how people maintained and grew agency and power without 
having to rely upon or needing the external system to change first. And I think there's another place where I see that too is this may be an aspect that um, comes out of Buddhism as well, um, where there, there is this idea of, of realizing your perspective on things is important, right? And so that you work on yourself to help you have the resources to deal with the external process, right? So I think these things help make reparations more likely, um, A, because it makes you, um, it makes you stronger, um, and it also makes you, it makes your um, humanity, it makes your humanity to the, to the <clears throat> oppressor more visible. Because part of what the oppressor is feeling is they're feeling the intoxication of their own ability to enforce or create uh, um, suffering without any sense of response. There's, there's, and, and you can even see this in our movies and our culture, stuff like this, where you know, the, the heroic thing is to fight back. And so when someone can't do that or they don't do it, there's this, and they don't seem resilient, there's a certain kind of contempt that arises in the oppressor. And so by demonstrating that resilience from an internal source that they can't even see exactly where that's coming from, it's like, how did you, how are you still standing? How is this mm -hmm. happening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's, and, and there's something in them that recognizes the, the spirit connection, which is actually the part of them that's totally connected to you regardless of whether they like it or not. The part of them that's also the divine is connected to you that's also the divine in a way that they cannot control. And when you can tap into that, I think, and part of that is by being powerful in ways that they, they didn't know where it came from. Because oppressive, oppressive systems a lot of times think they know where power comes from and they think they have a lock on it. Right. And that's where I think being able to tell a story to yourself that is true. I mean, to, to be able to recount those stories, of how do we get to where we are? And we we did this. And I and I'm thinking about that in the black community, though, you know, as the generation that did the civil rights process continues to get older, that the, the ability of the oral tradition and the, um, the cross-generational knowledge to actually keep moving is something that, is, um, that needs to be preserved. Um, I did want to mention one thing about the last question before I well, go on. Uh, hold on one second, uh, Brother Dante. I want to um, give uh, Reverend Angel, who just had a chance to come in, a chance to um, kind of respond to some of the questions and her thoughts about reparations. Uh, welcome, um, Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams. And we have asked some of the questions about connections between spirituality and reparations, uh, and also responsibility of spiritual institutions and communities, um, as well as healing and spiritual um, um, rituals for reparations. <laughs> All that, huh? <laughs> I, I got to listen. I was in, in and out at, at, at a meeting, and so I was uh, listening here and there. I just want to, uh, first of all, just thank Dante for uh, what they're saying and, and uh, expressing. I, um, you know, I, I think that uh, the question of reparations is, can only be a spiritual uh, conversation. I think one of the missteps we've had over the years is to try to uh, situate reparations as a political conversation or an economic conversation and uh, that it is only going to be received and understood as a spiritual conversation, a spiritual uh, reckoning. Um, and I think that the human heart uh, yearns for that. I think even the human heart that is intoxicated, as you uh, beautifully said, Dante, on power uh, yearns for that because the emptiness of wielding that power is also apparent to anyone that uh, takes a look. And I think one of the mistakes that we can make, and, and I would you know, caution against it, is to try to look at the people that are on the most extreme ends of things. And that's not who you need to worry about. It's just like politics in America. It's like, what are the independents? What are the people in the middle doing? The people that um, you know, have some, have some um, sway potential in them. Uh, 
and, and rather than look, looking at their extremes. So I want to say that anything I say is referring not to people that live on the far ends of the extremes, the people that are, I want to say, system makers, um, structural um, the bridge makers, right? They're, they're creating the structures and they're invested in the structures in overt ways versus what I think of as people, uh, and the, the way that I often talk about how whiteness itself works as a, a sociopathological cultural ontology that it uh, induces, it's either seduces, induces, or reduces everyone, but um, many white people are for the most part actually seduced or, or induced into it. And induced is a particularly important um, frame because to be induced is somewhat invisible and white privilege and white supremacy works most handily when it is invisible. And, the, and therefore the surfacing of it uh, and the ways in which, not just that it causes harm, which I think is also a place that we've sat in a long time and have conversations, the situating the conversation in the way that it causes harm to the people that are oppressed and marginalized, et cetera, I think exactly right, Dante, like it invokes a kind of contempt. It also reinforces the notion of the inferiority of those peoples. Uh, and so uh, when people are not committed to supremacy, white supremacy as a, as a uh, formal ideological participation, but rather the subtle ways that human beings judge each other all the time, I think the, that the strategy has to be something that unseats the hidden and implicit bias that allows people to continue to participate in things. That, you know, and there's many ways in which progressives point, like, you know, scream and shout at, like, all the horrible ways that people that are marginalized are suffering. And I have to say, I'm like, mostly what that does is tell most of the people, like, yeah, that's right, they're inferior. It wouldn't be like that. Uh, they wouldn't be in that position if only they fill in the blank um, because they are the, the structures of white supremacy and the machinations of white supremacy are invisible. Uh, they're invisible, as invisible to white people as they are to um, many people of color. So and that internalize oppression and, and, and therefore participate in be, being gatekeepers to, to um, those those forces. So anything that, um, any strategy I think that is going to be uh, viable and lasting um, and not temporal uh, is something that's going to call forth the liberation of white peoples themselves from the same structures uh, that bind them by revealing to them the, the ways in which it binds them, uh, not the ways in which they are complicit. I mean, I think that works for some people, but at the end of the day, most people are most moved uh, by their own um, self-interest. And which is why people will politically make uh, votes and, and concessions that are against their material self-interest in the interest of their I identity self-interest. And so we, we watch that a lot. And a lot of times we try to have these conversations that, you know, with, with uh, uh, poor working class white folks uh, without understanding the hierarchy of values that identity will trump a material resource every single time, right? Maybe identity is existential, therefore it's spiritual. And the, the identity as a, as a white person as a person that is better situated and somehow better regardless of their current state is something that's very, very seductive, very, very seductive. So if you don't un like crack open the way in which that is also has that person trapped, um, I think it's very difficult to have a, a lasting um, and, and spiritually deep a call for reconciliation and 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 the desire for liberation from from those patterns, um, because they, they they appear to benefit people and situate people in in better locations in in their in the social strata, if they look only externally, um, and I and I think we are you know our political reality shows that we're at the at the edges of 
what we're going to be able to accomplish just by pulling on people's, you know, better angels, if you will. And so uh, calling people into the truth of like, you are trapped in this. Uh, you know, you've been hoodwinked and bamboozled, as Malcolm would say. And, and led and, astray. And led, it, and led astray that you are trapped, that you are kept from your full existence, that you are kept from your full capacity, your full uh, thriving as a human being, that in fact you have been induced into uh, a, a way of being that is, and I've, I've been really leaning in on this conversation, it surprised some researchers I was talking to last week, they were struck by the truth of it. You can go and look it up in a medical dictionary and ask any, any psychologist about it, and if they think, think about it with any sense of um, objectivity, it is, becomes very clear that the construct of whiteness is a sociopathy. sociopathy that it induces people away from their basic human, uh, in, their innate human capacities, a care, connection, and compassion. And the problem is, is that we can't really limit those entirely just to the, the, the so-called other. And we, um, when you name that, people drop experience, and if you can name that and, and, and give language and narrative to it, people will touch into the recognition of their loss the loss of the own the of the wholeness of themselves just amongst themselves not right because because the uh, oppression white oppression was perfected amongst white people before it was introduced and uh, put upon burden on on other people other people they did it to themselves in the class or lo location first so I think that this the conversation of reparations is a conversation as much about reckoning self self reckoning as it is about and and spiritual and liberation as it is about anything else and the and the fact of the of, you know dave and i talked about this briefly before uh, the call that the fact of the the material um resourcing and the and the right writing the upwriting i would say of things in that regard um, must be coupled with an, a, a real understanding of how it is a spiritual uprighting. Otherwise, we end up capitulating to, uh, you know, the, the money as deity, right, and the abs the absolving of all things. And uh, that that is not the message that we want to set because it reifies the 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 paradigm. Um, and and it reifies it most especially because the because it is white white-bodied people that are holding access to to that the, the grand deity of money uh, and so you don't want to reassert power in in the form of money and so the reparations has to be something that is more than money even even as it is it does have that concrete re that concrete um effect of um, reconciling or helping to rectify material imbalances and, re and imbalances that's caused by ma material resources, but it must be imbued with an understanding that it is also a spiritual uh, energy currency that is being um, communicated through the resource of money. So something um, I would suggest comes with, comes with it. It's not just like, hey, I paid my way and I'm done. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I'm, I'm okay now, but um, some kind of um, vow, you know, in the way that all spiritual traditions do, we, we're committing to something greater in that act. Um, Thank you, you for said, that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one in the end here. The beautiful, the beautiful faces that I see and have seen and right. you know, people I know. So I just want to uh, thank everyone and just acknowledge them. Um, little platform that you're, you're giving to speak here. Thank you. And we we appreciate you uh, joining, and and we also appreciate um, all of the other guests. I just want to call out everyone who uh, participated in this conversation. Uh, Dante Washington, um, also uh, Brother Jamoke, um, and um, uh, Rabbi Lynn. Um, as well as uh, Reverend Renita Green. Uh, we go back, protested with Reverend Renita and Ferguson. Um, and 
Uh, I want to close uh, with, um, uh, first I want to introduce you to the Executive Director for Fellowship of Reconciliation, uh, Reverend Dr. Emma, Emma Jordan, um, who is um, our new Executive Director. Uh, and um, uh, Reverend um, Dr. Emma Jordan is also um, uh, the Executive Pastor at the Concord Baptist Church of Brooklyn, New York, and former executive director uh, of the Children's Defense Fund of New York. Uh, and we're so happy that uh, she's part of our leadership. And um, um, Reverend Emma, <laughs> and I think I'm... <laughs> This, what an amazing conversation this has been tonight. Um, in some ways, I feel um, just incredibly revived um, in my spirit um, because this is such a, a difficult time in our country. And wow, who are we to be raising a difficult uh, issue like this right now? Um, and your uh, just what you have contributed tonight has um, just been, I see a way forward. And um, I'm so grateful um, for everybody who has been on this call and the questions that um, the people have contributed as well. Um, I think that this conversation that we've been having is timely. Um, and it's timely because in the language of um, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, like this conversation has been about, it's the, the conversation about reparations is about pursuing peace, a peace that's built on um, justice. And what I know is that the that FOR has um, lived and pursued peace, not by um, ignoring um, or minimizing or erasing the legacies of violence and um, of war um, and harm that um, people have done, but by pursuing justice. Um, it has been an affirmative pursuit of justice. And um, I don't believe that we can have any expectation <clears throat> for um, a lasting and enduring and authentic peace if we do not have the courage um, to address it, the, the issues and deal with the conditions um, that have caused such a lasting and enduring pain for generations of people and not just black people in the United States, but for all people in the United States. It is in our interest to seek each other's healing because we are um, interconnected and I, I do believe that. Um, you know, I, I've heard it said about the Fellowship of Reconciliation that our business is to stop war. And the way that we do that is by working to create the conditions for peace. Like, like one of the um, the ethic, one of the key strategies for um, the work of ethical peacemaking um, is to be actively engaged in removing the causes of violence, actively engaged in bringing um, healing to the breach um, in human relationships and um, uh, the breach that's been caused by injustice and, and actively engage in lifting up opportunities for repair. Um, and so advancing the work of reparations is about hope because it is about our engagement um, in the work of healing justice. Um, I, I don't believe um, I'm not banking on American laws being on the side of reparations. Um, American laws have rarely been on the side um, of oppressed people. 
sometimes, but not, not all the time. And so I'm not banking on the legal system to deliver to us um, healing. I'm encouraged by the efforts um, that are underway across this country to build like these broad co coalitions and the partnerships um, to address our hearts and our souls. I, I, I do believe that that is, um, that is the most powerful place for us to begin. And I, I, as you all were talking, I was thinking about um, Ida B. Wells and um, remembering um, her fight um, with the, um, the courts and the railroad system and she you know brought this case against um, the railroad system and she won initially and then the courts overturned her case and she was so discouraged and so um, disheartened and and so she said something that I feel often when I consider the weight of this the legacy of harm um, in our country you know Ida Ida B. Well said, um, if I could just gather my people <laughs> and uh, fly away, you know, if she could just gather her people up and to fly away. And, um, but she didn't do that. She, she stayed the course and she fought as long and as hard um, as she could um, with her heart and with her soul. And, and I do believe that that's our cause too. And so you know, I, I just would offer to us um, something that has been a part of um, um, our legacy, the, the, the part of the, the, um, the gift um, of the strength of um, African-Americans, black people in this country is this perspective that you know, if we, if we are working together, there will be light at the end of the, at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I'm remembering the song our ancestors sang, um, walk together, children, don't get weary. Walk together, children, don't get weary. I, I know that um, even in the campaign that we are mounting, that there are going to be difficult days ahead, but um, I believe that if we walk together, um, we will see some progress and, and it may not happen, you know, in our own lifetime, but I do believe that we will advance the cause. Um, and I am I'm grateful for everybody who has participated in this conversation tonight. And I am looking forward to working with you to continue to subvert this world order. So thank you. Thank you for that, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today and to our <laughs> panelists. And I really want to invite you to continue on this journey as we explore reparations through a spiritual lens and also um, be active in creating a culture of grassroots reparations where, you know, if the state will not acknowledge this if we are not able to uh, systematically change um, some of the structures that have been built. In what ways can we take it into our own hands to create a redistribution of, uh, create a culture of redistribution of, um, of wealth and power and then also um, do the work to morally um, repent and atone for the sins of you know the sins that we're all a legacy of so um uh let's see i want you to make sure to check your email um we will be sending you guys direct next steps that you can take to get involved in the campaign um you can go to for reparations that's for reparations.org to endorse our campaign and to give what you can to support us um, we are also on all social media via our at for reparations so that's twitter instagram facebook for reparations 
And um, I'm gonna go ahead and invite Amber McZeal back on just to go ahead and close us out with a, with a final prayer. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, because my, told you my Wi-Fi was a little spotty. Um, so I just wanted to uh, <coughs> share this, um, this offering with a little bit of context. I will, I'm so grateful to be a part of a conversation like this um, that's nuanced and has depth. Um, and especially as we transform our thinking around money, um, moving toward it as a symbol for the energy um, that we're trying to reorganize the distribution of, reorganizing the distribution, the exchange of the energy. Um, so I, I'm using this term a lot, and this is what has actually helped me as sort of uh, applying my, a spiritual practice undergirding my activism with spiritual practice um the idea of decoloniality um decoloniality and it's you know um sort of polar opposite coloniality is a way of explaining and articulating the unconscious and implicit bias that we are still um living within the structures that we live within are shaped and formed by this logic of um, domination and hierarchy. It has a, a metaphor, uh, an intersectional axis. One is race, one is capitalism. So when I'm thinking of a project of rehumanizing myself, just as a spiritual practice, I'm trying to undo and uproot the logic, the symbolism, the naturalization of this hierarchy that places one human being as more valuable and another human being as less in whatever form it may manifest. So for me, the way it looks is to take a decolonial attitude or decolonial approach to the work. And that's the spirit that I'm sharing this piece within. So it's on cultivating a decolonial attitude. If you can hear the sound of my voice, let your shoulders fall from your ears. Unclench your jaw and allow it to relax. Let your tongue fall from the roof of your mouth. The project of decoloniality is mainly about nurturance and care. The spiritual and moral wounding caused by racialization insists that we practice care and nurturance in more radical ways. I'm using the term radical here in its traditional form. I wanna emphasize the root. The etymology of radical relates to root, to foundation, to soil. Coloniality is a type of soil. And taking a decolonial attitude is transforming the very dirt that we stand upon. The anagram for race is care. Where race succeeds at dividing care can congeal hearts with minds, selves with others. Beyond this dream of race, we are chanced with crafting care. For me, the decolonial attitude repositions my approach to slavery, to repair, to harm, and to healing. I want to offer my soul-centered perspective that has become a part of my practice. If I can tap into another dimension of this coloniality, I bear witness to a radical love tradition of decolonial expression that has existed and still exists in eloquent simultaneity. Parallel to the heartbreak and soul wounding of coloniality exists the uneasing pulse of radical love, where the periphery has always lived, existed, created in a type of pluriverse. 
A decolonial approach can recenter spirituality in our pursuit of liberation, in our pursuit of more humane social relationships. I pray we find the methods and collective agreements to imbue our institutions and our social structures with the wisdom and radical love of the periphery. That the power of this love transforms the social imaginary, refining our shared values and transforming our concepts of social harmony. I pray we release racialization as a naturalized phenomenon, transforming that logic at cellular depth. If you can hear the sound of my voice, allow your soul to embrace the radical love tradition as foundational to decolonial praxis and practice allowing your shoulders to fall from your ears, unclench your jaw, release your tongue from the roof of your mouth. May we practice nurturance and care with ourselves and each other as we unlearn the logic of dehumanization, of coloniality, of dominion, recentering in the radical love tradition. Thank you all.